chapter 5, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now I want to make a reference quickly to something we've read already. Go back to Genesis chapter number 2. Keep your hand here, of course. But this exact statement was found at the moment that he created man and woman as well. Now I want you to look at Genesis chapter number 2. Look at verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now watch what it says here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now there are a lot of people in uh, especially non-denominational type churches. I've heard this from especially I've heard from a few groups of Baptists, I've heard the right interpretation of this, but I've heard many people, let's just say that in general, many people are, are, are wrong in the, in the sense that they believe that man and woman both were created in the image of God. Now first let me explain to you what it means to be made in the image of God. It says likeness, right, as well, to be made in his likeness or to be made in his image. What is an image? It's a figure. What is an image? It's the way that something looks when you look at it, right? God is a man. God the Father is referred to, and then we know that God was born as a son. He was, he was a baby boy, grew up, and he was what? A man. The Holy Spirit, is. there's a male pronoun that is used to refer to the Holy Spirit because it's God's spirit, and God is a man. So God looks like a man. The body and the image of God is Jesus Christ, which is male. So when this says that, that man is created in his image, it, a lot of people say, well, that's mankind. That's not what this is teaching. And I'll show you a couple of different ways. Number one, I want you to look back again at 26, where we just read. Notice there where it's saying, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Actually, skip to verse 27. It says this. So God created man in his own image, and then it says this. In the image of God created he him. Notice that. Created he him, male, referring to the man. Now watch this. Male and female created he, he them. So I want you to realize how careful it is to, number one, tell you first off that man was created in God's image. And then it follows it up afterwards, not saying they or just repeating the same thing and giving you more information. No, it clarifies that man was created in God's image. And then it says, and then he made both of them, one's male and one's female. Mentions nothing of female being made in God's image because God is a man. God is not a female and it's referring to the way that he looks. He's a man. We man. see that again in Genesis 5. It's recapitulated again. It's recapped again. Look at verse 2. Well, actually verse 1. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. So we see that same statement that says male and female created he them. So you see the consistency here? Where it's very careful not to say that the female was created in, in God's image. Then it says, male and female created them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now I want you to uh, notice there, what did it say that their name was called? It says Adam. So both of them were called Adam. And this is actually, uh, it goes back to our culture. Another thing that our culture, a tradition that our culture has because we are a, a, uh, based, or we are based upon you know, Christian morals in the Bible. The reason why the, uh, the woman takes the man's name is because it's biblical. Because they were called Adam. You know, after, after uh, my wife and I stood at the altar, when we were announced as a married couple, you know, we, you know they said, kiss the bride, and then they said, I now, you know, uh, I now present to you. Is that what they say? I now present to you. What is it? No, 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 I now present to you. They'll see, he'll, he'll look at the, after, you know, right, right before that, you know, I now pronounce you after, yeah, here. right after that, then he says, I now present to you Mr. and Mrs. Tyler Baker. So it's, yeah, it's present. So notice that. That's not just a coincidence. Other cultures don't do that. Actually, uh, Hispanic cultures, uh, Brother Rick living in Tucson, I'm sure he's aware of this, very often will the man take the woman's, uh, uh, the, if a son is born, 
the son will be born after the will be given the woman's name as well, his mother's name. So it, it's not just all oh, everybody does that. No, there's a reason behind it. It's because our nation was based upon the Bible. That's why they were called Adam. Another reason why they're called Adam and they're not called Eve is because the man is the boss, because the man is the head of the household. Genesis chapter number three, when they fell, what happened? He didn't come and say, first, Eve, what happened? He came and he addressed the man first. Because the man's out of the household, he takes responsibility for his home. He's the boss. Uh, I want you to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 11. I want, you to, I want to look at this and actually explain this to you further. And it ties in with man being created in the image of God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 Look at verse number three. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. So notice there that the same way in which Christ is our boss, right? The, the, the woman has a boss as well. Man. Now keep reading. And the, head of, and the head of the woman is the man. We read that. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered... Dishonoreth his head. It's talking about, uh, you know, the custom of our hair length. That it's a sin it goes into for a man to have long hair, and it's a sin for a woman to have short hair. Verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And then it says this. For a man indeed ought not, he said he shouldn't, a man indeed ought not to cover his head. And this is why, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. So he, he actually explains a man should not have long hair. And the reason why a man should not have long hair is because he is in the image of God. After he just got done explaining that women should have long hair. Now, if women, sh you know, are supposed to have long hair, would it make any sense if they were also made in the image of God for God to say you should have long hair? No, it wouldn't. So two things you learn from that. Number one, Christ being the image of God did not have long hair because he is the image of God. He is God in the flesh, right? That's the first thing that you can learn from that. Number two, we can see that women are not created in God's image. And this further proves that the image actually is what he looks like. Saying because he does not have long hair, we would shame him if we ourselves had long hair. And that women, because they are not created in the image of God, but they are created to be different. You know, if we, if we both look the same, there's no, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no attraction there, right? The difference is actually what causes the attraction. So there's meant to be a difference. And when women walk around and try to make themselves as masculine as possible, they're not attractive to men. Right. The, 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 op the opposite or the opposition is actually what causes the, the attraction, the differences, the distinctions. And God telling a woman to have long hair is meant to strengthen the distinctions or the differences between his creation. He wants there to be differences. You know, women wearing, you know, skirts and dresses and men wearing pants and not confusing that where men are wearing dresses and skirts or women are wearing pants. That strengthens the, the, the distinctions. It further strengthens the distinctions that God created that there's supposed to be a difference between men and women. There should be a difference. And a man being made in the image of God actually plays into the fact of him being the head of the household. That's why he made him in the image of God, and then he gave dominion immediately thereafter. Now I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 5. That's why it's mentioned there as well when we're reading in 1 Corinthians 11. That's why him being in the image of God is mentioned in the chapter within the context of talking about him being the head. Because that plays into it. So that's why we refer to ourselves as, uh, that's why my wife... You know, it's not, it's not Tyler F Frederick, it's Tyler Baker, right? And it's Jessica Baker, right? That's why here in America, our wives, that's my wife's maiden name, if anyone's trying to figure that out. You know, that's why, you know, here in America we do that is because it's, a, it's based upon a Christian nation, originally at least. 
the culture is based upon the Bible. I want you to look there in verse number 3. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son, watch this, in his own likeness after his image. Now, does that sound familiar? Notice it wasn't a daughter. It was a son in his own likeness after his image, saying that this son looked like him. In the same way in which man looks like God, this man that was born of the man looked like him. You understand that? That's a further proof of this, of course, that of what likeness and image means. And then we see the definition of it as well. <clears throat> it says, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And Seth lived, after he begat Enos, 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Cainan. And Enos lived, after he begat Cainan, 815 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. Verse 12, and, and Cainan lived 70 years and begat Mahalaleel. And Cainan lived, after he begat Mahalaleel, 840 years and begat sons and daughters. Say Mahalaleel five times fast, Brother Hall. No, I'm just kidding. Does anybody remember what is the, uh, the longest? I asked Brother Russell this. Now, what's the longest name in the Bible? You're not allowed. You already know. What was it? you got to pronounce it, though. Has anybody got it? I remember where it was, too. It's in Isaiah. Isaiah 8.1. That's the only reason I remember it is because I, I remember it because it's a part of the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. And it's the very next chapter. It's Mayher Shallow Hashbass. And I'm naming my next summer. No, I'm just kidding. Look at, look at verse number... Uh, it's Isaiah, the, the name of Isaiah's uh, son is who it is. It's Isaiah's second son. <clears throat> hey, a real, I noticed this is real interesting, real quick. So uh, it's, it's about Mayher of Shallow Hashbaz. Real quick while we're talking about Mayher, Shallow Hashbaz. So yeah, I tried, we were talking about that earlier. Like if, if he's my friend, man, I'm shortening his name. I'm not calling you. He's like, you're like, hey, you mind if I shorten your name? And he like tells you like three quarters of it. Yeah, Shallow Hashbaz will do. Like he just cuts off like this, just the first part. But uh, uh, the Jews will say that, that Isaiah 7, 14 was, was uh, fulfilled when Meher Shalal Hashbaz was born. Now, there is, a, uh, there is a, an immediate application like there is for everything. But you can disprove that that particular uh, uh, application is the full fulfillment. And I'll tell you why. Because it says that a virgin shall conceive, right? Well, after... And they try to point to the ne very next verse. If you look at Isaiah 8, it would be the next verse. I think it's verse 2. And I don't think it's a part of the same verse, verse 1, where he's actually presented. But in verse 2 is where he says, I went unto the prophetess and she conceived. Right? Well, that's another way of how the Bible says I went in under her. It's just saying I went unto the prophetess. Why did he have to go to her? I mean, it's plain and simple. But they just say, oh, he just went to her and then the prophecy was fulfilled. That's foolishness, number one. He, he, went in, he went in unto her, just like how anyone is conceived, right? And then it proves, you can prove that that fulfilled, was not fulfilled. Isaiah 7, 14 was not fulfilled by uh, Meher Shalal Hashbaz. Because it tells you in like Isaiah 5, 4 or 5, I don't remember the chapter, you have to look it up, that Isaiah has another son before that. So you can prove without a shadow of a doubt that in any sense... Like, obviously, I know that Isaiah 7, 14 is quoted in the New Testament, but you can even prove from the Old Testament that Jews are wrong in, in, from their own interpretation, like playing in their field, because Isaiah already had a son. I, Isaiah already had one son. So, guess what? His wife wasn't a virgin, so there's no way around it. So you can't apply that to, you know, Mayor Shallow Hashbaz, because even if you were to say, oh, that was a, you know, a miraculous conception, she already wasn't a virgin. So it didn't matter. You understand what I'm saying? Because Jews use that. They try to say, well, that was Isaiah 7, 14. Because there is a couple of things that are quoted about uh, right there after Jesus is born that are immediate applications. About Emmanuel. I don't know if you remember that, but that comes up again right after that. If you look at, compare when you get to Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. And you'll see what I'm talking about, the immediate application. But it can't be a, fulfill, a, a, a full application. It can't be. It's impossible. <clears throat> look there in... Uh, Genesis chapter number 5, and we are in verse 15. 
And Mahalaleel lived 60 and, and 5 years and begat Jared. And Mahalaleel lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalaleel were 890 and 5, and he died. And Jared lived 160 and 2 years and begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. <coughs> And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. <clears throat> Verse 21, and Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. Verse 22, and Enoch, lived, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. First thing I want to point out is you'll notice that the pattern was broken just now. You know, uh, when, when you're reading down through there, it will tell you how old a person was when they had their child, and then after that, for, for uh, you know, historical purposes and tracking the, the age of things, it tells you how old they were when they died as well, right? And it says, every time, I'll give you an example, I want you to look at verse 17. And all the days of Mahalaleel were 890 and 5 years, and he died. So it just tells you when he died, right? Well, if you look right before that, it just says, And Mahalaleel lived 60 and 5 years and begat Jared. So it tells you he lived, he begat Jared, and then it says and he lived this amount of time and he died. But look what it says about Enoch. It says in verse 21, And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. Well, that's the same pattern, right? But then look at the next verse. Verse 22, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. So notice it doesn't just tell you that he lived another 300 years. It's very specific. And it tells you that for those 300 years, what did he do? He walked with God. That's interesting. That it, the pattern breaks right there. So you know what you see immediately? Something special about Enoch that these other people didn't have. Look at the next verse, 23. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. Now you'll notice that he lived a much shorter life, right, than the other men did. That were recorded. Verse 24 gives us details as of why. And Enoch walked with God. And then it says this, and he was not. For, that means because, God took him. Now, uh, when the Bible says that someone is not or was not, it's like when, when uh, you know, uh, Jacob thought that Joseph was dead. You know, he said, my son is not. He thought he had died. He thought he was torn to pieces by a beast, a ravening wolf or whatever he pictured had torn him apart, right? And he said he is not. Well, right here when it says he was not, it's a way of saying that he was taken, right? He was taken to heaven. His earthly life ceased because he was taken immediately to heaven. And then it says for me because God took him. Now, uh, we're going to come back to this verse. I have a couple more things I want to say about it, but I want to look at, in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, 5, where this is actually referenced, and we get some details there as well. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 5. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death. Now notice, he didn't actually die, did he? His earthly, when it says he was not, his, his life ended on this earth, is really what it's saying. So, is not, it was not, that's usually used to refer to death. But in this case, he didn't actually die, technically, because his life just ended while on earth when it says he was not. So it says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and then it explains it even further, and was not found, because God had translated him. For, that means because, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, notice it said in the Old Testament we read just now in Genesis 5, it said that he walked with God. Talk about how he had fellowship with God. He was close with God, right? When we go to the New Testament, we read here in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11 being the faith chapter. It talks about the great faith that all these men of God had in the Old Testament. And you wonder why Enoch had such a close relationship with God. When you look at the reason in which God was willing to just take him, right? It was because of the great faith that he had. Look at what it says again there at the very end. It says, that he pleased God. Why? Because his faith. 
For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Look at verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what was it that pleased God about Enoch in particular? The great faith that he had. The great faith that he had. You know, uh, we know that, that God is a God that glorifies himself. He's a God that created the world so that he can receive glory through his creation. You know what? God gets glory when you are willing to trust in him. God receives glory when you just say, I, I, you know, I know that you're so powerful and you're so great. I don't need to worry about anything. I'm just going to fully put all of my faith and all my trust in you for everything, right? I know that your commandments are perfect, therefore I'm going to walk in all of your commandments. Because I'm going to trust you because I know, you know that, that you are faithful, right? That is the type of life that Enoch lived. And, and, you, and you look at how great of a relationship that Enoch had to have with God that he took it. Think about that. To take something. He's like, I want that. So I'm going to take it with me. Enoch's living his life, and then one day God just shows up. I wonder if he knew about it, but one day God just shows up. He's like, hey, Enoch, you're coming with me. I want you in heaven with me where I am. And you look at some of the other people that lived in the Bible that had great relationships, like John, the disciple John, who wrote Revelation, Gospel of John. You know, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? <clears throat> but God didn't take him, did he? No, I'm sure he loved him, but God didn't take him. You know, Abraham was considered the friend of God. He's called that a couple of different times. He's considered the friend of God. God came to him and treated Abraham you know, much greater than he treated almost anybody else in the Bible. They had a great relationship. Moses, it says that God spake to Moses, you know, it says, as a man speaketh unto his friend. These are all people that had great relationships with God, right? But Enoch had such a great relationship, God was like, we got to stop doing this long distance stuff, man. You're just coming to heaven. And he got to stand there before him and be with him. He just wanted him closer to him, obviously. He just wanted him to be there. And you know what it was? His great faith. You know, we look at, we look at uh, faith oftentimes like faith is just important just to get us saved. But faith is the most important aspect, really, to your Christian life even after you're saved as well. That's what enables you to do everything else in your Christian life. That's what enables you really to follow God's commandments. If you didn't believe that God's commandments were going to be profitable to you in the first place, if you didn't have faith in God's law, you're not going to follow them anyways. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you didn't realize and trust that God knew what he was doing when he told you to spank your children, then you're not going to spend your time doing it. But if you really understood, that's going to be profitable. I know that God knows what he's talking about. You have to have that faith first, and then that guides you into what you need to do, right? Everyone understand that? So you see the importance of faith. Do you know what pleases God? What's going to please God? Without faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You want to please God? Have great faith in God. Just trust God. Stop questioning whether God's right or wrong. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. You know what? Enoch had great faith. And that was the one primary thing that's brought up in the New Testament to give you a commentary in which why he was taken. Why God took him to heaven? Because he had great faith. And that's just an interesting statement, for God took him. You know, I, that's what I think of. It's like when just the child says that or you think that in your mind, I want that, so I'm going to take that. God must have loved Enoch greatly. So if you want to have a close relationship with God, which you should, you should desire for a close fellowship with God. You know, it's not all about just coming here and doing things at church. You should internally and personally have a, 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 a great relationship, a close relationship with God. You should desire to be close with God. The reason why we come to church and we do all of this here is for him. That's, that's, that's all the ultimate goal is for him. That's what it all is. The, the main reason why you, sh you do everything that you do should be to please God. Amen. To please Him. And you say, how do I please Him? Have great faith. Amen. Look at Enoch. Have great faith. Hey, I'm, you know, I love everybody here, but how great would it be if God just took me? How, great, how happy would that be? If God loved you so much that He would just take you. I would miss my family, and I would miss all of them, right? I'm sure you would miss your family. And it puts you in a straight betwixt two when you start really thinking about it, right? Because I don't want them to be here without me. And what are they going to do?
But it's like, man, I desire to have that relationship that Enoch had with God. I desire that God would talk to me like he talked to Moses as a man speaketh unto his friend. I wish that I could have sat at the table with the 12 disciples and I could have leaned on Jesus' bosom. I want to have that relationship with God that Enoch had. To where God loves me so much that he desires for me to come and be with him in heaven. He's like, you know what? You read my word and you pray to me all the time and I come down and talk to you every once in a while, but that's not enough. I love you so much. How about we just end your life now and you just come and be with me for all eternity? Amen. That sounds great to me. I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait till I finally get to look at Jesus. I get to look on his face. The one who died for me on the cross, who loved me, who created me, and made a plan because he knew that I was sinful to redeem me. You, know, you need to have a close relationship with God. You need to have a close relationship with Jesus. You need to love God and please God just like He not pleased Him. And it starts with having great faith. Having great faith. That's what pleases God. <clears throat> Look at verse 25. And Methuselah lived in 180 and 7 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and 2 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and 9 years, and he died. And Lamech lived in 180 and 2 years and begat a son. And then it says this in verse 29. I'm going to stop here for just a minute. And he called his name Noah. Now, of course, we know who this is, of course. Saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So he's saying... That, that Noah, when Noah comes, that he is going to, to comfort mankind on the earth because how God had cursed the earth. And I believe that, that, that the curse that God originally put on the earth, I believe it's obviously still present today, but I don't believe that it's as grievous. I don't see any other way that you can interpret this verse. It says that he's going to comfort them. Noah is going to comfort them concerning the toil of their hands, saying that they have to work very hard, right? They're going to have to work very hard with their hands. He's saying that they're not going to have to do that as much afterward, right? So, so that, and what happens with Noah? The world's destroyed, Right? The world is totally destroyed. Noah is used, and him and, you know, there's eight of them total, of course. Him and his three sons and their wives, and his wife, of course, too, are all preserved. And then afterward, it seems to me as if maybe the world is not cursed as heavily as it was prior to that. Now, I want to point out something real, very, very interesting. And some people would read... <clears throat> Some people will read the generations here when, when genealogies are given. That's what we're reading, of course, a pedigree, you know, genealogy, whatever you want to refer to it as. The Bible says generations every time. And they'll think, like, what is the point of all this? But there's tons of stuff you can learn from this. And I, and I kind of alluded to this when I talked about the river uh, in, uh, the, the, uh, or the gold that's mentioned in Genesis chapter number 1. And uh, I talked about how when I was reading 1 Chronicles 1 that I realized – how Havilah and Ophir were those two brothers right there, right? By comparing, you know, those two scriptures. And how 1 Chronicles 1 is what's hated the most by ever. 1 Chronicles 1 through, like, chapter 1 through, like, uh, chapter 9, I think is where it is. Is like the genealogy. People are like, why the genealogies? Why does God put the genealogies in there? But they matter. And if you, if you study them, if you take time and study them and break things down, you'll learn things. And I want to show you something real interesting. You may or may not have heard of this. But I want you to look real quick. I, I want to show you how this works exactly, how you can do this. We'll do this slowly. If you have a calculator, you can do it on the calculator. If you're decent math, you can do it yourself in your mind. I want you to look at verse number 25. The Bible says, And Methuselah lived in 100 and 180 and 7 years, and it says, And begat Lamech. So he was 187 years old when he had his son Lamech. Okay? And that's very important that it tells you purposely when they have a child. Then you're able to continually have that reference point going forward. Every time it tells you how old that person is when they have a child. You understand what I'm saying? So because if they were to just tell you how old they were when they were born and when they died, well then it well then it dies with them. You understand what I'm saying? The math is gone then with that person, right? You don't have a, a, a reference to another person that lived after them. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? That's why the Bible gives you a reference of someone that's born from them. Then you can carry on because that person will live long. That mean, you ever thought about that? But that's why it does that. Okay? So it says that he's 187 and he begat Lamech. So Lamech is born. 
uh, at the time that Methuselah is 187 years old, okay? And it says Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters, right? And then it just adds it up for you in verse number 27, and it says this. And all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years. So that's verse 26 and verse 25 added together. Okay, and then you look at verse 28 and it says, And Lamech lived in 182 years and begat a son. Now that's important because we have the age that Methuselah was when he begat Lamech. Now we have how old Lamech was when he begat Noah. So you know what we can do now is we can take the age in which, which Noah is born and we can find out how old Methuselah was, right? Because it's the, it's the span of Lamech's life. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Very simple math, right? So it's 887 is the age of Methuselah when he begat Lamech. Now look at verse 28. It says, and Lamech lived 182 years and begat a son. So if we take 187 and we add the length of Lamech's life, that is when, or Lamech's life when he begat Noah, right? So this is at the time that Noah was born. All we have to do is add 187 and 182, right? And what you get is 369 years, right? That's 369 years. I did it twice. 369 years, okay? Now I'll show you why this is extremely interesting. So now... When Methuselah, or when Noah is born, pay attention, when Noah is born, Methuselah is 369 years. Does everybody get that so far? When Methuselah was born, uh, or when, when Noah was born, Methuselah is 369 years old. At, when his grandson Noah is born, he's 369 years old, okay? I want you to flip over to... Verse 11, there's a paragraph marker right there. Look at verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So what happened when Noah was 600 years old? The flood began, right? When Noah was 600 years old, the flood began, right? The flood began, it started raining, and also it tells you that the fountains of the great deep broke, broke uh, you know, broke up. It's talking about, you know, I believe water, I believe it's clearly speaking about water that's in the crust of the earth or under the crust of the earth, right? So the point is that Noah was 600 years old, okay? So 600 years went by when, when it uh, went by during Noah's life, and then the flood. How old was Methuselah when Noah was born? How old was he? Just a moment ago, I, we, we added 369, because it's 187 plus 182, right? So it's, he's 369 years old when Noah was born, okay? Okay? And then Noah is 600 years old when the flood occurs, right? Okay. Well, what's 369 plus 600? Huh? 969. How old was Methuselah when he died? 969 years. So do you know what? You know, just coincidentally, he's the oldest man in the Bible, by the way. But do you know that Methuselah actually died the very same year that the flood occurred? Did anybody, did everybody in here already know that? I find that extremely hard to believe that he just coincidentally, unless, I'll give you two scenarios. I find it very hard to believe that he just coincidentally died the same year as the flood, coincidentally. What is possible is that before the flood came, if Methuselah was maybe a righteous man, God allowed him to die a peaceful life. And God, in the sense, took his life. That's possible. But it is also, I believe more possible. This is just my personal opinion. 
I believe that Methuselah most likely drowned in the flood. I believe that that makes the most sense to me. I believe that it would be an awfully big coincidence, and you would even have to take, you would have to, and the reason why is because you would have to infer the fact that God took his life. That's a pretty big step to say, well, he was probably a good guy. We don't know he was. And God just allowed him to die a peaceful life. We don't know if he did. What we do know is that he died the exact same year as the flood. What do you think the safest bet is? That he died in the flood. That's the safest assumption. Now, that could be wrong. But like I said, the number one reason why I pointed this out to you is, is to show you, and I'm sure I, I figured the majority of people do that. You know, but I wanted to show you actually how to do the math and just add it up and figure it out. It's not that difficult, right? Maybe somebody has never thought about it and then they see, oh, that makes sense because I wanted to explain to you the references. And if all the adults knew it, well, now the children, who if they were paying attention, now they understand how they can use these references. Now, does the Bible explicitly tell you that? It does not. This is another point. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So you need to, you need to, there was somebody who added these numbers up, because somebody just preached this and I heard it when I was like probably uh, 18, I believe, or 19, the first time that I ever heard it, you know, uh, from an evangelist that would come through our church all the time. I remember the very first time that I heard it. But I, so I didn't find this on my own, but you know what? Somebody did. And that's interesting, isn't it? Somebody sat down and they charted this sucker out. And they wrote up a timeline, and then they're like, what in the world? 969? 369? Plus Noah's life, 600 years old. He died the exact same year as the flood? That's interesting. It's very, a very interesting find. Somebody had to find it. You know what? There's so many more nuggets in the Bible. You need to study the Bible. You need to study God's Word. There are so many little amazing things in there that the Bible doesn't explicitly say. If everything was super easy to understand, then the Bible wouldn't say study. A workman. It takes time, and there's a lot more in there that you can find. So one thing that you can learn from this as well is not only is that just a cool little interesting fact that the Bible doesn't, the reason why it's so interesting is because it's not explicit, like a lot of things in the Bible, which actually is an attestation to the divinity of the book. Then it just has these underlying things that the author put in there, right? And it's like, whoa, that's super cool. But it's just, just slipped in there, right? And not only, not only should we study it, but this also. If Methuselah did die in that flood, which the whole world was wicked, Noah was, out, was obviously more of a righteous man. If Methuselah died in that flood, Noah was obviously more of a righteous man than his grandfather was. Right? And this is the point that I want to make. A lot of times people may not grow up in a Christian family. Maybe they did even, but their parents don't really devoutly serve God. Maybe you grew up in a home where you were Catholic, or maybe you grew up in a home where nobody went to church, or, or maybe you grew up in a home where somebody was like a Buddhist or whatever it may be. But you don't have to allow things like that to influence you. We go out soul winning and people are all the time saying, you know, like atheistic, or the atheistic philosophy of, well, why are all these people just, just you know, why, why are they just born into these other religions? You make your own decisions. That's the point. You do what you have to do, right? I, you know, my dad just so happens to be a pastor, and, then, and I also am a pastor. But there are plenty of pastors where, they're, where their parents didn't even serve God. So you don't have to have this great influence by someone Sometimes you just have to have self-motivation and you have to just have your own zeal. Sometimes you just have to stand on your own two feet and you, the zeal you know, should come from the Lord. And because you love God, sometimes you need to be the leader. And you don't need a grandfather and you don't need a father and you don't need parents to force you to do that which is right. It's a blessing when you have them, but that's not an excuse. Amen. Noah stood up and he was more righteous than Methuselah. Noah stood up and he lived a better life than his grandfather lived. He lived a better life than his father lived. Noah was a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord when the whole world was wicked. And, and you know what? If we, had, if, we, if we had a world full of all of just, everyone's just a follower, the world would be a mess. There needs to be men that stand up 
and they don't need someone else to comfort them and to handle them with gig gloves. There, need to be, there needs to be men that stand up that say, hey, I'm actually going to be a boss. I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to stand up, and I don't need somebody else to always come and pat me on the back and tell me how good I'm doing. I don't need you to tell me how good I'm doing. I'm just going to do that's what that which is right anyways. I don't need some you know figure that, that that's going to influence me positively. Hey, we it's it's all right if you have those, but you know what? Sometimes you just need to man up. Amen. Sometimes you just need to do that which is right when you don't have a good example. You you know what? Look to the men in the Bible. They're supposed to be your examples. And, and like I said, it's great if you do have an example, a spiritual example, but sometimes it's not there. Sometimes there isn't someone that, that you know, is there to help you when you get knocked down. Sometimes it ends up just being you. And you know what? You still need to do that which is right. Amen. You know what you need to do? You need to get some stinking courage. Amen. You need to get some valor. Seriously. You need to get some boldness. And you need to be able to stand on your own two feet and do that which is right just independently. Amen. And not always just and a lot of times you'll see that when a pastor falls, everybody else falls too. Because they were really hit their anchor. And they were really, the, that was their rock. You'll see people that go to church, and then, and you know, I, actually a guy that I work with, he mentioned something to me like this. He said that he used to go to a Baptist church all the time, and then his pastor, they found out, was committing adultery. And he said, it's been six years, and I haven't went back to church. And I said, hey man, you know, the Bible's full of examples of men doing bad things just like he did. And that's wicked what he did, but that's not a reason not to go to church. There's a lot of good pastors that haven't done things like that. Go find a church and go to it that, that one of those men's churches. Right? But here's the thing. People will just fall out of church because of things like that. It's like, no, they shouldn't be your rock in the first place. Right. You shouldn't just put everything on just some man. You know, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You shouldn't just put everything on. You have to have this guy as your example or you fall. Read the Bible for yourself. Find things in the Bible yourself. Love the Bible on your own. Outside of some influence by someone else. Before I ever heard the name Stephen Anderson, I loved the Bible. Just as much as I do today. Amen. I went to a church... That was a different style church than those churches. And I love the Bible just as much then as I do, as I do right now. I didn't need him at all. I'm, you know, I'm thankful for things that I did learn from him. And he's an idiot now, just as a disclaimer. But here's the thing. I didn't need him. I love God and I was going to serve God until the bitter end before I ever heard the name Stephen L. Anderson. And you need to be that way on your, by yourself. That's right. You know, people that may attend this church for a long time, I don't want to be anyone's rock. Amen. No pastor should be your rock. No man should be your rock. You need to love God on your own. And you need to be able to stand on your own two feet on your own. And you need to be, you need to, you need to be able to survive without a leader as a man. There's nothing wrong. God ordained leaders in churches. But you know what? Men need to be men, they need to be leaders as well to a degree, because they have to leave their homes. You have to be the leader for your children. You have to be a leader for your wife. And if your pastor falls, you shouldn't fall just because he did. Amen. You shouldn't be leaning on him. You should be leaning on God. Amen. You know, so you need to you need to love God and you need to want to serve God internally, independently. You're, you know, that's really what you want on the outside. You understand what I'm saying? Or that's why you do it on the outside is because that's really what you want on the inside. Right? You know, we need to be able, just like Noah, you know, he may not have had a great example. He may not have had the greatest grandfather. He may not have had the greatest father. I don't know what his situation was. But you know what? It's very likely that his grandfather died in that flood. And you know what? Noah did it. Noah didn't need his grandfather to do that which is right. Noah didn't need his father to do that which is right. Noah didn't need a dad that's a pastor. He didn't need anything like that. He decided that he was going to serve God. And that's how men need to be. I'm going to serve God to the end. That's what you need to make your mind up. I'm going to serve God to the end. 
and I'm going to lead my family, and I'm going to lead my children, and I don't, I, you know, it's good to have an example, but I don't have to have one. You know, I'm glad that I have a pastor, and I'm going to go to church no matter what, but hypothetically, or theoretically, if I didn't have a, a, a pastor, I would still be serving God. Amen. If all churches were banned and I had to be underground, I'm going to wake my family up and we're going to read the Bible anyways. And I'm going to preach the Bible to them. And I'm going to, you know, go soul winning. That's the attitude you should have. You shouldn't just, the church falls apart, whatever. You know, we, you know there's all types of things going on right now. Church is falling apart in, in, in ways, if you will. You know what? You should be able to serve God anyways. You shouldn't have your foundation built upon something that's temporal, like a man, things like that. Or a church. Things like that. You should be able to stand on your own two feet and serve God. You should be serving God because you love God. You should be doing it for yourself. Don't just put everything on someone else. Don't only be serving God because you like this guy that likes God. You know, he really loves God and I like him. So I guess kind of like, in a way, I love, I love God. That's not how it should be. And a lot of people are like that with the, with the new IFB. That's right. Tons of people. They're there for the entertainment and they're there for the show. Mm -hmm. And if all that went away tomorrow, they'd go away too. That's a fact. Right. And here's the thing. We're not going to be like that. Amen. I, I moved there because I love the Bible. That's the reason why. I learned things from him. And it was because I already loved the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? That was my reason for going there. Right? There's a lot of people that get a part of movements and stuff like that, and it's not for the right reason. Do you understand what I mean? You shouldn't need something like that to hold you up. Right? You need to, you need to just be able to stand you know, for yourself. If you have to stand alone, you need to just love God and do that which is right. Standing on your own two feet. Bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, being a rock that we can trust, dear Lord. For being a, a true rock. Uh, greater than any man, greater than, than, than anything. Even plausible or, or feasible, dear Lord. We ask you to be with us and bless us. Strengthen our faith in you and in your word. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you that you would help us to be diligent students and, and open our eyes that we may find more things in your word. Dear God, that, that, uh, that would create a zeal in us. Uh, help us to have the love of, of souls. Uh, we pray for 35th Avenue in their situation right now, Lord. And uh, we also uh, ask you that you would uh, bless the fellowship, uh, the food, and the fun for tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.